Krishna and all that made from marble in Jaipur and for the installation and consecration of those Rama and Krishna Murtis, they had brought special priests from uh, yes. India, from India. Who, who know all the Vedas. So they were able to get their sannyasa in the regular, regular way with all the scriptural mantra and the fire ceremony and everything, just as it is in India. Huh? Yes. Oh. Sure. I, will, I, will, I will show you tomorrow all the pictures. They have brought an album. Huh? Uh, I will look when uh, comes the newspaper. What is the name here? Yeah. <laughs> it gets a newsletter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Illumination? No. What is and it is the newsletter and newsletter. Uh, so, the So Sanya's name was given. Yes. Uh, the other person took the name Swami Ishwaramayananda. Ishwaramayananda. He was called Ian Brenner. Mr. Ian Brenner. He took the name Swami Ishwaramayananda. Uh, yeah, no, he, you don't know him. You don't know him. Uh, and he is a spiritual uh, leader. And uh, uh, mother's name is Swami Ram Narayan. And she is a lady who is very, very devoted to Ma Anandamai. She is ah, Anandamai Master. Devoted. No more important. <laughs> she became, uh, uh, she has taken mantra. Huh? But we have. She is uh, an artist. She is an artist now. She is qualifying. She is studying art. Yeah. 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 We were guests by Anandamai. Yeah. yeah. Yes. She has been yes. to. She <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Uh, Frank have. Uh, they went to India, stayed, and they visited Ashram, Anandamai, and Kanka. Very, very uh, good to us. She is a lady from Holland. Great joy. Full of uh, What do you say in German for uh, happy, pleasant, full of uh, joy? Joy. Happy. Joy. Glück, 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 Okay. <laughs> and Mother Yuan, Mother Yuan from Paris, France, Mother Yuan of Toulouse. She used to be called Roditi, yes, yes, Mrs. Yes. Roditi. She was the first time when Swamiji was in my rooms. First, you, you came from uh, Toulouse. Your Toulouse. husband was a professor. Yes. Yes. He remembers. Yeah. That was in 1968. Yeah. 69. Yeah. Early, early 69. Yeah. Early 69. Yeah. Yes, winter. Long ago. Yeah. 19 years back. Yeah. Uh, winter always tends to span two years. Yeah. It includes uh, the end of one year and the beginning of uh, another year. A bridge season. I will give this to me and come back. Om, Om. Now, now, ten minutes. Uh, we can have you on. Hari,
devotees gathered together, the Lord is present in a special way. Air is everywhere present, all pervade. Ether, space is everywhere present, all pervade. There is no place in this universe, in this all of our air. Space is not present, and the whole planet itself is in space. So, space, the subtlest of all elements, invisible, intangible, but everywhere present. We move about in space, we live up in space, have our being in space, move in space. So, in Vedic literature, sometimes, to enable the human mind to get a little grasp of the intangible, supreme, transcendental being, the great reality. They give the analogy of space. It is the nearest approach to what man can think about because he is experiencing it every day. So upon the basis of what he has seen, he is experiencing every day, he can think about. Upon that basis, they try to explain, make him understand a little, comprehend a little, that which is beyond comprehension, the great reality. They say space is that which is contained within that, the higher being. Subtler than space is that being. More all pervading than space is that being. And similarly, air also. Air is present everywhere. So, we are able to breathe. No, no matter where we go, we are still able to breathe. Whether we are in the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, far east, or occident, the west. Everywhere we are alive, we are able to breathe because everywhere air is. But then, if you burn an incense stick, the same air becomes something special. Ah, grand aroma. You bring some flowers, fragrant flowers into the room. Ah, I smell violets. Ah, I smell violets. So, the air becomes tangible. The air becomes something very special, filled with fragrance. In the same way, God is present everywhere. He is the life of our life. But when devotees meet together, he is present in a special way. He is like the air that has suddenly become fragrant because of the presence of flowers. So his presence makes it a very, very special presence in devotees are because he loves to be in the center of where his lovers, his devotees meet and have a moment of silence, think about him and glorify him, chant his name, speak about him and thus they turn towards him and raise their hearts and minds towards him. Therefore, in that place, he delights immensely. He delights immensely. It is his special place. Where his devotees are, there he is in a special way. And the whole atmosphere becomes just as air becomes fragrant in the presence of uh, flowers, the atmosphere becomes uh, the uplifting, inspiring, elevating in the special presence of God in the midst of devotees. So we dedicate this satsang to the special presence which is the central uh, thing here, which has attracted us here, which has brought us together here. And it is true uh, that uh, will, the wish and will of Divine Being, through that grace of the Divine Being, that we are having this gathering. It is the grace that uh, brings about spiritual fellowship into our lives. It is the grace that brings occasion of a satsang in the life of our people who are uh, immersed and involved in uh, this passing show. And therefore, uh, Manifestation of grace takes the form of a spiritual fellowship among seekers. Manifestation of grace takes the form of a little satsa. It is that grace we are now receiving from the Supreme Being. But we dedicate this satsa to Him. We also dedicate the satsa for the highest good, the supreme welfare of all of you here. And we start by thanking the Lord for this great grace is a wonderful gift and we next pass on to chanting his name.
Beloved immortal Atman, blessed children of light, devotees of the Lord, sadhaks, spiritual seekers, aspirants, lovers of righteousness, and those who are eager for a good life, a life of kindness, compassion, truthfulness, purity in heart, word and deed, a life of selflessness and the spirit of service, the desire to make people happy, and a life of discipline, dedication, a life that is beautiful, a life that is worthy of our status of human being crowning glory of God's creation, the supreme work of God, high above all other forms of living beings, animals, birds, beasts, reptiles, insects, high above all other forms of living beings, the crowning glory of God's creation, made in his own image. To all of you, we welcome and invite to this fellowship in the spirit, in the presence of the invisible, all-pervading divine being. Invisible, 
presence of the one who is your source and your origin. The invisible, subtle, unmanifest presence of the one who is your support, the basis of your being, the very essence of your existence, the innermost core of your consciousness, and the unmanifest and subtle invisible presence of the great reality which is the ultimate fulfillment of your life. Into his presence we welcome you and ask you to participate in glorifying him and feeling his presence and offering ourselves like a flower and sweet. Yesterday was Thursday. So when we came here from the railway station, we decided not to simply disperse and drink a cup of tea, but also to have a, a little uh, short informal time of uh, little God thought, a little satsang, little prayer, and then call upon all the great spiritual teachers, masters, mystics, all the great ancient illumined enlightened souls from most ancient times beyond, far beyond written history, human history, from the dim past, from the ancient times of the Vedic period, the <coughs> Vedic age, those who had attained to this God experience and who were thus illumined, from them right down the millennia, corridor of centuries, right down generation after generation of human history. There have been a succession, an unbroken line of spiritual masters, of teachers, of human beings. And it is this unbroken line of teachers and spiritual masters that has kept carefully nurtured and guarded and protected the living flame of spirituality, living flame of transcendental spiritual experience, generation after generation. And in their own lives, reliving it, vivifying it, revivifying it again, they have handed it down to posterity. It is this wonderful long line of an unbroken succession of teachers that we remember yesterday because the whole of the entire global human family had reason to be deeply grateful to them for it is because of this unbroken line of success, successive teachers that even in this modern age, in this 20th century, in this fourth quarter of the 20th century, in spite of all its uh, adverse trends of life and in spite of all its uh, various the contrary the philosophies and tendencies, nevertheless the light of spirituality is still present to bless mankind, still present for mankind to avail of so that it can become divine, it can uplift itself, it shine the divinity which is its birthright, which is its unalienable essential nature its true eternal identity. Therefore, we recall these great masters yesterday being Thursday and as an expression of our thankfulness and gratitude of heart, we had a little special prayer dedicated to all the masters from ancient times through centuries and generations, right up to the modern times, last century, this century and present great luminaries like Ramana Maharshi, Swami Shivananji, Arvind Roosh, Ami Ramdas, Anandami Ma. They were with us until very recently. Very recently. And thus, we paid our homage to them, but at the same time, thank God that He had made this provision to keep the lifeline between Him and mankind open always to this channel of these great masters. That is his perpetual grace. 
He always says, I am never cut off from you. If you only look to me, I look at you. If you only step one step towards me, ten steps I take towards you. If you only stretch out your hand, I bend down and grasp your hand. I lift you to myself. This is a promise that he has kept this channel always open by this long line of unbroken succession of illuminated God, enlightened spiritual master, perfect masters. So that is how we mention how they should occupy a central place in our life, even as Thursday occupies the central place in the week of seven days. It has been specially set apart as Guruva, the day for allowing the masters, the day for remembering master, day for the expressing our gratefulness and joyful thanks to the masters. Because of them, there is still light in the Because of them, there is living spark, spiritual retained divinity. At any time we wish, we can go and light up our life source. Just as one lighted candle serves to light a hundred candles, a thousand candles, ten thousand candles, even so. Today is the fifth day. It is the day of the second half of the week. And it is dedicated to the Divine Mother. Mother, Mother has been yours. So we commence this chapter with a little thank to the Divine Mother. Day before yesterday, I was 
Wednesday, Wednesday, twenty first eve. We had a little gathering at the Yoga Vedanta Center in the Shivananda Ashram. Us. That time, it was all people connected. It was not a public satsang, it was not a public function. Therefore, it's only people who all belong to the uh, asked uh, white circle because asked is nearly, uh, uh, I think, more than uh, 40, 50 uh, brands, uh, uh, groups throughout Belgium. Uh, some of them are well organized, regular activities, even publishing tracks and various activities, but some not so well organized. And so it was members from them, uh, and a handful of them, because it was the announcement for that special, there was no such program, but it was announced the day previously, on the night of the concluding public function of Silver Jubilee, the twentieth evening, a beautiful hall. It was announced only for special residents of Alst, people of Alst town, it was announced. But then some people came from outstation also. So while we were talking, we had a little chanting and uh, spontaneously, as I said, I also sang the song of Immanence of Ram, Song of Immanence of Ram. And also I said, all right, you are all people who are in the spiritual life. You are all people who are well conversant with what yoga is, what Vedanta is, because you have well acquainted yourself with the writings of our beloved and worshipful Holy Master. Swami was one of the foremost and the most well-known among the modern exponents of spiritual life in man's human society. One of the most well-known modern exponents of practical spiritual life. How to practice spirituality in your daily life, at home, in your... Uh, stop short at awakening them and inspiring them. Next step was, in so many words, in great detail, elaborately, he outlined to them the practical means of attaining that great ultimate goal of life. He said, how to practice spiritual, how to make your life, how to make your life a means for the attainment of that great goal, so that by the very living, the manner in which you live your life, you begin to move forward ascend upward and draw nearer day by day to the great goal. So he was the prophet of practical spirituality. He was the prophet of practical spirituality. Thus he gave not only the meaning and purpose of life, did not, not only open our eyes to the Supreme, the higher 
purpose of poor faith, he also taught us how to do it. He gave us the sadhan, he gave us to the practical, easy practical means that can be applied in your normal daily life, which did not require any extraordinary or revolutionary change in your life, but which can be still applied where you are as you are in normal daily life. So that a slow but sure inner transformation is brought about in your entire personality. A slow but sure transformation takes place in your way of thinking, feeling, way of looking at things. Your attitudes change, your approach to life and things change, and your entire life changes. Because you are granted a new vision, you begin to see life, see, in a different light altogether. Thus, a slow but sure transformation, inner transformation, so that you become a new being, you are a different person. If you have a new vision of life, you adopt therefore a new way of life in the light of this new vision of life. And you begin to live according to certain sublime principles, noble principles, which you are convinced will take you day by day nearer to that goal. This transformation is brought about by spiritual sadhana, by change of angle of vision, by taking up a new direction to your life. Therefore, assembly of people who are thus in contact and acquainted with these teachings, I said, should need some special message, not the normal message we give to people who are not fully acquainted what yoga is, what Vedanta is, what spiritual life is, are not familiar with the teachings of Gurudev and saints like him, then they are given a different type of message. But I said, these people are people who know everything, who are already well aware of most of the, the basic factors of spiritual life. So we will see a special message. So as this idea came, I said, what will be the special message? I will make them take a new look at their own yoga and their own Vedanta. I will make them take a new look, understand what yoga is, what spirituality is, what spiritual life is. See, from a fresh angle, a unique angle, so that they will be able to understand it and grasp it. It will only be something added to whatever whatever they already know. And thus, I said I will give you in a very brief, a very concise way, what is the essential inner structure of yoga and Vedanta. What does Vedanta mean? What does yoga mean? What does spiritual life, spiritual life mean? Actually to you, actually to the human individual. What does it make for your life? What does it mean? So I said, I will try to make you understand Yoga and Vedanta in this light by first of all giving you some simple, easy to understand analogy. I said, I will give you some analogy. familiar to you, by which you will immediately know, ah, this is what it means, the inner content of spiritual life means this, the inner content of yoga means this. As an analogy from a familiar, very familiar daily experience of people, I told them, look here, you all know about a staircase or a ladder. It's every day people make use of it. <laughs> I did it twice already. Huh? Today I have done it huh? many, many times. Huh? In the morning also, came down from my room, went up to Mr. Pike's room, came down from Mr. Pike's room, went up again. And now huh, I have come down a whole flight of steps. Huh? And, uh, uh, and now I am up. Therefore, I said,
Elizabeth's pastor. So, no, who does not know a staircase? So I said, look, what does a staircase do? What does a staircase do? What a staircase does entirely depends upon you. Staircase does what you want you want it to do. A staircase can take you from the bottom high up, or the staircase can take you from a high step boom down. So it's uh, what you want it to do. You can make use of a staircase to go to a higher place. The same way you can make use of the staircase to come down. <coughs> ladder can take you to the uh, rooftop. Ladder can bring you to the ground. So, this is how you uh, utilize it. To what application you put it. Similarly, as you look here, a man is there. He's got strength of arms. And if his mind is right, if he thinks rightly, feels rightly in the heart, he will make use of his hands to do wonderful things, right things, which makes him feel good, which makes other people happy, benefits others, is useful to others, helps others. It can do a hundred thousand things, which everywhere is full of beauty, full of goodness, makes people happy. Lessons their difficulties, or with the same hands, he can make people very unhappy. He can be fighting, quarreling, and uh, hitting people, and doing all manner of things where it's all uh, whole atmosphere is uh, made restless. Atmosphere is very uh, full of agitation, and it can be uh, the cause of much misery to people, much harm to people. Uh, and I gave a simple analogy. A man is passing by. Suddenly, eh, there is a road that goes by the side of the waters, the river. And suddenly, he hears, hears a cry for help. Someone has uh, uh, walked a little too near to the edge and slipped and fallen into the river, doesn't know how to uh, swim, about to die. And then he hears this man walking there, he has, uh, runs down to the river and immediately wades into the water stretches his hand, grasps, and saves his life. So, pulls him out of the water. So, the strength of his hand has been the means of saving a man's life. But if the same person who was walking was not the right type of person, he was having a long thoughts in his mind, and it so happened he encountered someone on the bank of a river, and there was only no other person was there, he could uh, go and uh, grab hold of his money and purse and all that. One push, he can put him uh, into the river. See? So that's how he uses his hand uh, and the man uh, is done. Uh. I said, look here, it all depends upon their floor. Your uh, the way you use what has been given to you. See? Whatever has been given to you is your human status is your human potential, power to act, heart to feel, mind to think, intellect to reason, inquire, discriminate, analyze, investigate, see? reach out towards higher and higher knowledge, wider and wider vision. This is your human status. The power to act is given to all, human beings as well as animals. But other three factors, thinking, feeling, reason, the supreme prerogative of man, is the great privilege of man, is the uniqueness of the human individual. And therefore, he has the potential by making use of them and applying in the proper way and direction, he has the potential to go beyond even his human nature, become an ideal human being, become a superman, become a godly person, become even divine. Realize that I am divine. Inherently, I am a birthless, deathless, imperishable, immortal center of spiritual consciousness, a part of the cosmic consciousness, 
part of the universal, eternal, indestructible universal soul. I am part of that. Deep within me, my real identity is that. It is not this earth identity. And therefore, that uh, triple faculty of thinking, feeling, reasoning has the potential in it to take him to the highest state of realizing his divine nature, his real nature. This is not present in animals. So all their physical potential, they only uh, manifest through their sharp claws and sharp beak and the sharp teeth, see, fangs. And so the law of the jungle is might is right, the law of the jungle, uh, uh, fish eat fish, uh, small, big, big feet is small fish. And so the whole law of the animal life is uh, uh, violence, attack, destruction, everything negative. Now, we are only stating a fact. We are not going to be in judgment. We are not trying to uh, think that animals are lesser. They have their own place in God's creation. Uh, God knows. Uh, so, we are not either uh, commending or condemning. We are not sitting there. We are only presenting a natural fact see, of existence on this planet Earth to bring out a certain truth, uniqueness of man. See? Or if he was not endowed with the higher nature, his physical action also would be destructive, negative, violent, but then it would be animal like it, not human. But a human being, being what he is, he is able to make use even of this physical potential, the power to act physically, which he shares in common with the entire brute creation, he is able to make use of this potential also towards supreme, higher attainment. He can make use of it to struggle, make effort, endeavor, he make his life sublime. He can even uh, make use of this to sacrifice his very life for the good of others. Okay? So, these four faculties are what have been given to you, what you have received as a gift, what you possess, <coughs> what makes you a unique being, a being superior to all the millions of other forms of life which have been created together with you. What a great privilege. And I said, giving these two little simple analogies of a staircase and a ladder and the analogy of the physical strength of a human being, physical strength of the arm can be used to save a life, also to send a person to death. It depends upon how it is applied, in what way you make use of it. What way you make use of it. Thus, I said, Similarly, your human potential, how is it being made use of? This thing that has been received by you and you possess, which, which is really your human status, which makes you a human being, endowed with this power to feel, think and reason. Reason is the highest faculty of the human individual. And if these three are beautiful, positive, all your actions are also wonderful, positive. Because if these three think in terms of compassion, kindness, spirit of service, selflessness, dedication, wish to help, see, wish to make people happy, wish to benefit them, then you become a person of good works. Good works. All your actions see, are a, a great asset to society in which you live. All your actions become the real wealth of your own uh, immediate uh, contemporary environment. And you become a, a being whose very life, whose very thoughts, actions enrich society, uplift the uh, very standard of the social stream, make people feel good. And so you go through life as a light, go through life as a a great source of uh, good, a great source of uh, the help and solace and benefit and happiness. So your life becomes a blessing to others. 
This is uh, what one can make oneself of by directing these faculties in a positive, creative, constructive and a useful manner. It enriches your own contemporary society, makes everyone happy. It becomes a source of joy to others, a thing of beauty as well. Otherwise, you could, you have another choice. You could go to society as a perpetual problem. You could go to society eh, everywhere spreading agitation, spreading trouble, eh, making people unhappy, and, uh, uh, undoing good things that other people have done. You can go everywhere eh, so that eh, when you come, the social stream is polluted, not uh, purified. And the social standard of living is uh, one minus, not one plus, uh, upgraded, but upon minus. It depends upon what you are making of yourself, what you are making of your life. And I said, this is the central crux of man and his life. The vast, vast majority of people, they get caught in the lesser aspect of the human status, lesser aspect, that is bodily aspect, it has got its sense appetites. Mind has also got not only thought power, but also its sentiment and emotion and its desire and cravings, and it has also got uh, this desires and cravings, they are the lower aspect of mind. If you sell yourself to them, if you uh, get caught in the net of these, uh, they drag you, they overcome you, they enslave you. And become entangled and enslaved by them, you are at a mercy. You are not capable, you are not anymore able to purposefully make use of your human potential. Why? Because you have uh, lost your independence, becoming enslaved by desire and crave, by sensual appetites and the push impelling push of the nature of the senses towards the sense intelligence and the nature of the mind and desire towards the objective fulfillment, you lose your freedom, you lose your independence. When you are no more able to purposefully direct your faculties in a desired <coughs> direction. And I said, yoga is halting this type of situation, realizing the great mission you have in life, recognizing the supreme goal of life and suddenly realizing that these faculties have been given to me to be purposefully and intelligently applied so that I may make my life supply. I may elevate myself towards the supreme goal, supreme goal. Therefore, I have to use them. I have now to utilize them as the tools. These are the tools God has given me. And when the saints have declared, you are divine, your uh, destiny is human, divine perfection, which is already in you, inherent in you, as a whole tree is inside a seed. Divinity is there, lying, sleeping, slumbering, lying, latent, neglected, forgotten, ignored by you. Now, now, come, come, arise, open your eyes. Recognize your divinity and turn your attention to this all important central task of awakening this divinity. Do not allow it to slumber and die away without awakening it. Then a great loss, there is no greater loss. A wonderful golden chance will go away. This great grand opportunity God has given you will go away. Therefore, come, come. Right now at this moment, turn your gaze towards your inner divinity. Pay attention to it. Start working upon it. So, yoga is making use of these four faculties which are now the cause of binding you to this world through taking these objects, this outer glitter of objects, being overcome by them and succumbing to their see, fascinating, succumbing to their attraction and becoming totally involved always thinking of worldly things, always uh, engaged in worldly activities, always uh, see, desiring and uh, loving and desiring only passing after things, you have become completely turned away 
in the direction of the many, in the direction of the temporary, in the direction of the passing and perishable, in the direction of the imperfect, finite universe and its many, many petty little finite objects which are all subject to change, decay and destruction one day. They are all perishable, all changeful, all finite, limited in time and space, containing the potential to give you little present experience, also the potential to give you lot of trouble, huh? lot of huh? Therefore, you have taken this to be real and you are now uh, caught in this now. And therefore, your entire faculties are enmeshed in this. Your reasoning also is subserving your mind and its desires. Your mind and its desires is completely directed towards this multifarious world appearance. And you are busily engaged in accumulating and keeping them, thinking that they are to happy. So body, mind, intellect, emotion is involved in part of the work process. Then you are weeping, lamenting, weeping and wailing, fighting and fighting, sometimes smiling, sometimes crying, laughing, weeping. If you want to put a stop to this, yoga says, change the direction. Now, look towards that great eternal reality, which is all full, which can satisfy all your desires, which can give you not only little momentary present sensations, which can give you supreme, <coughs> infinite happiness, infinite joy, immeasurable, boundless bliss, <coughs> total satisfaction. All desires will be satisfied. Come, come, when the great goal is there, huh? Huh? why do you go after a little mud puddle when the ocean is calling you? Therefore, the yoga is a call to turn away from the temporary, perishable and the petty towards the grand, and therefore, it is the turning of, changing of the direction of your life. The man seeks happiness, nothing wrong, because God made you to seek happiness. He did not send you here to weep and wait. See, happiness is your real nature, therefore you spontaneously, automatically seek happiness. It is already put in, it is a built-in tendency. Because you are joy, you are bliss, you are ananda. Therefore, seeking happiness is perfectly legitimate and perfectly all right, perfectly moral and anything. But you are seeking in a foolish way. You are trying to find happiness where it is not to be found. All objects in this universe have only use. They can be useful to you. They have utility, but they cannot give you happiness. They can make you uh, provide a little comfort, a little convenience. But happiness you have to see in another direction. And moreover, more than the attainment of happiness and peace, the great thing is that you are meant for divine perfection. You are a divine being, you are not a human being only. A human being is just some little temporarily added factor. But eternally and unchangingly you are divine, you are divinity, a divine spark, a divine spirit. That is your reality. Temporarily human nature has been added on to you. But it has got not only a nuisance, but it has also got a value. If you understand that it is being given to you in order to fulfill your mission and attain divine perfection, then your very human nature takes on a new significance. You begin to see it in a new way. Oh yes, my human status has been given to me to help me to attain perfection. Therefore, I must apply my human nature to bring about this dawn of divinity, dawn of divine perfection. That is why human, being, human status has been given to me. Therefore, it is the most important golden gift of God. Now I know it. I will not misdirect it. I will not misapply it. I will direct it in the desired direction and apply it for the attainment of that supreme goal. So, when this realization of your divinity comes into your awareness and you become conscious, I am not an ordinary earth person, I am a divine being. Temporarily passing through earth as a pilgrim, uh, passing through some strange town. On uh, your way somewhere else, you have to drive through various towns. You know, this is a passing passageway. And you are a being who belongs to some other realm. Once I know that, aha, Vedanta comes. Vedanta is awareness of your eternal divine nature. Your 
unalienable, unchangeable, eternal, permanent, divine nature. I am the immortal soul, without birth, without death, beginningless and endless. I am the imperishable, immortal, eternal being, without beyond name and form, beyond time and space, earthless and deathless, I am the one. That is Vedanta. With this inner awareness comes awareness of new goal. Therefore, the whole direction of your entire life is changed from the passing the temporary towards the eternal, towards the all perfect eternal reality. This is Vedanta. And once this change of direction has come about, these faculties that imply or comprise your human status are now directed in that direction. And they are applied for doing all that is necessary in thought, word and action and sentiment to attain that supreme experience. Therefore, the body is engaged in all such activities that are conducive to spiritual progress. It is engaged in such works that bring about day by day higher and higher ascent of the spirit towards the Supreme Being. And all thoughts are directed towards the Supreme Being. You begin to think of God becomes an important subject of your thought, your inner content of your mind. Constantly there is God thought, God remembrance. And then your reasoning takes on a new hue. It begins to reason between the temporary and the permanent, passing and the uh, permanent, imperishable, perishable and imperishable. This non-self and self, the appearance and the reality, non-eternal and eternal, it begins to discriminate. The intellect becomes a great help in helping to overcome yourself by yourself. And thus, feeling also now becomes directed towards God in devotion. Devotion, divine love. Thus, I said, Yoga means, Vedanta means a, a new awareness coming into your being which makes you change the entire direction of your life. See, it is the changing of the direction of the faculties, thought, emotion, and intellect. Now, now given a new direction. What happens to the old direction? It is there, only it becomes purified, it becomes spiritualized. The old direction cannot be completely eliminated, it is part of your life. So, together with paying the attention that is necessary, thinking, feeling, reasoning about earthly things, secular matters, simultaneously a new dimension comes into your life, thought, feeling, Intelligence elevated towards supreme reality. Gradually the emphasis change changes. Your inner life assumes the uh, major place. Your inner life becomes important. Inner life becomes the more important thing. Primary, it becomes secondary. And this inner change affects the outer life also. Outer life also gradually begins to become more and more spiritual, more and more idealistic more filled with the quality of the spirit. And thus, the faculties of action, bodily action, faculties of thinking power of the mind, feeling, the emotion, and everything becomes directed towards the divine being. And you also constantly are alert, awake, vigilant, reasoning. What is this? Now the reason starts to say, if you are engaged in any particular aspect of life, particular lifestyle, particular way of living your day-to-day -day life from morning to night, you begin to carefully see what part of my life is going to help me move towards this great, grand, glorious goal. And are there in my life any such parts, any such activities, any such factors that are likely to hinder me in moving towards this great goal? And if there are, no, they have no business in my life. I have decided what my goal is to do. I will start eliminating them, putting them out. They are not going to be part of my life. I am awakened now. I am vigilant and watchful. I will not allow anything 
come into my life which is likely to hamper and hinder me in this upward ascent unto divine perfection. That becomes the intelligence keeps a watch. And all such factors that are likely to be helpful in this great goal, it starts to acquire. And things which are already present, it starts to strengthen, enhance, make them grow, make them more. And those that are not there, newly starts to acquire. Thus, there is a transformation of life. Vedanta is this changed awareness and changed direction in your life. Yoga is the emphasis of applying this potential towards the many, the passing scene is now withdrawn from there, applied here. So, your human status becomes an asset. Your human status becomes a tool, the instrument for attaining divinity. You make use of every faculty, your feeling, your sentiments, emotion, your thinking power, the power of thought, remember, and your thinking power which is very disciplined and trained becomes a powerful uh, force within you for concentration, meditation, constant dwelling on the, the divine uh, idea. If it is discipline and if restlessness and agitation change. And ultimately, ultimately, reasoning power becomes your greatest asset because mind is likely to revert back to its old habit because it is uh, by, by nature fickle, fickle, not steady. And so, moments of inspiration makes it change its direction. But old habit once again can make it revert back to old direction. So the intellect is your greatest friend at that time. I said, no, it is always awake, alert, vigilant, vigilant and constantly keeps your watch upon the mind. I said, no, that is finished. Don't go that way. Come this way. So as many times as the mind becomes, succumbs to its old habit pattern, and the force of habit goes in a wrong direction, intellect takes it up and guides it in the right direction. And therefore, we have to strengthen all these faculties by such satsang, which help us. So yoga is detaching your human potential from the passing, perishable, attaching it to the eternal, imperishable, supreme, divine goal. And you constantly have to go on doing it. This is a simple thing. Yoga is the uh, changing of the direction of the living of your life. Yoga and Vedanta mean the detaching of your entire human potential, the physical dynamic mechanism for the activity, thought, thinking power of the mind, feeling of the emotional level, and the reasoning power of the intellect, directing them towards this great goal, your mission in life. So it is this change of direction and applying the powers that go to make up your human life potential, applying them to uh, bring about this great ascent. This is your ascent of the spirit towards the supreme infinite cosmic reality. And towards this, the sincere seeker, the sincere spiritual aspirant, Sadak, constantly applies himself with great interest, great diligence, with keen enthusiasm and zeal. So this is the inner structure of your background. Detaching yourself non-eternal and attaching yourself to the eternal. Bringing about a change of direction in your life, new direction. This is a person goes out into the sun. If he is facing the sun, his face is bathed in light. If he turns around in the opposite direction, even though the sun is shining, he is only seeing his shadow. His face is in shadow. He is only seeing his dark shadow on the earth. He is not able to see the sun. Not that the sun is not there. It is there. You have changed in the wrong direction. Now change in the right direction, you become flooded with light. You can hardly open your eyes. You are dazzled. Your whole uh, face is based in light. So here is a such change in direction. And the directing of the human status and all it implies, all these faculties in this new direction, towards this new goal. That is your 
Gurudev said it in two words, detach, attach. Detach is from the passing perishable world. Outer appearance, attach is towards the immortal, imperishable, infinite, all perfect, divine being. Now I thought I would share it with you. This is uh, already there. And in the last satsang, most of the people were English knowing. So there was no necessity of translating into Flemish. Otherwise, it would have become a little, the flow would have been contained and then uh, obstructed. But uh, it was a free flow. So it's a single cassette. Huh? Otherwise, many people are thinking now, Oma especially is thinking, I will take these cassettes, eliminate all the translation portions, and keep only the English portion and make it into a new cassette. Huh? See? French translation and Flemish translation is what I am going to do when I get back to Peru. So this, what I shared as a sort of a parting message, in us, on Wednesday, 21st night, I thought uh, I will put it before you uh, today, 23rd, because that was something where Carla was not present and the Boyd family also was not present because they had taken leave. Uh, Gabriel was there. Uh, most of the others were there. Not there. Charles and Helen were there, of course. And those uh, who are from Cologne, you were not there yet, so I thought uh, I would uh, reshare that sharing of the Wednesday night satsang with you tonight. Because this simplistic and a very, very practical the, uh, definition of yoga, a practical understanding of what yoga and Vedanta actually imply to a human uh, individual when it comes into yoga. Not the come, rather engine. Please take your seats and be comfortable and at home. We will take the flower after that. <laughs> and therefore I thought uh, this is a subject that will bear repetition because of two reasons. One is its importance, its self-evident. <laughs> Otherwise we think what is yoga, what is Vedanta, we have to hunt in books and uh, we have got a uh, very complicated notion of uh, what yoga and Vedanta is. But I said this is a practical, very, very a, a, a explanation which is immediately makes sense to you. It means I have a new vision. I look at a new goal. It means I change the direction of my living. My living now goes in a new direction. And it means that I make use of my entire human potential for this great ascent of the spirit towards divine perfection. So what I have been applying and involving entirely towards this uh, little uh, secular outer universe only, now I start applying also to this inner universe and to this inner higher spiritual goal uh, and fulfill this quest in attainment and achievement. That is what yoga means. It doesn't mean something mystical, something uh, strange or something uh, far-fetched, something out of the way. It is neither out of the way nor far-fetched. It is nothing uh, mysterious or mystical. It is this simple thing, uh, making use of your life for what it was meant, uh, utilizing it for what it was given to you. Okay? These uh, eight faculties, unique faculties, which make your human status, they are gifted to you in order to uh, attain your own highest good, your own supreme welfare, attain uh, the supreme blessedness, which is your birthright for which you have been given this uh, human status. It is as simple as this. And this is the direct truth about uh, your life, the spiritual goal, and the yoga way to attain the spiritual goal. This is the direct truth. Shorn of all unnecessary uh, see, uh, mystery and complication and making it unnecessarily elaborated. Uh, complex no. There is nothing complex about it, nothing complicated about it. It is 
you are being what you are and not contradicting uh, yourself in your living of your life. See? You are divine and therefore you must give the awareness of your divinity and therefore make every part of you, every movement and every action divine. And to forget that divinity is to be, um, be very ungrateful to what has been given to you by God. And uh, to contradict yourself is to be very, very foolish. Is to be very foolish. If your life moves away from divinity and becomes a contradiction of what you are, it becomes a false life. It becomes counterfeit. See? And it is foolish because by doing so, you unnecessarily deprive yourself of your greatest good, your supreme welfare. And uh, the urgency and important is, if you delay it, no one knows when we will be called away. And even if you have to live a long life, by the time if you are all your aspirations, uh, you vapor, uh, evaporate and go away and all that, you are left just uh, dry and uh, what will happen, uh, even if you are living, you will be living like a uh, big tree or something. Uh, what does it matter if a tree grows for 100 years? If it does not produce any flowers and fruits and uh, makes itself a uh, it? thing of beauty to others, uh, what is it? What is the uh, use of uh, growing? It's better to flower like a wonderful, beautiful uh, uh, rose or some other beautiful flower, even if it's for a short duration. Yeah? Short duration. And, uh, spread the uh, fragrance and joy and beauty and uh, happiness everywhere. So the English poet said, uh, it is better to make your life like a fragrant flower, even if it's for a short uh, duration than to be like a uh, big tree. Therefore, our life is meant for our high, own highest good. Is it not selfishness if we work for our highest good? Uh, not for the good of others. The answer is, you can never attain your highest good until you make your life a source of the good of all that is Because one important ingredient one important uh, part of attaining your highest good is making use of this human physical body potential, this action, action potential, the dynamism of the body in the form of action, of such a quality in the nature that out of your action comes good to everyone, help to everyone. You become useful, a center of benefit to all. So that is one of the most important ingredients in this upper asset. Because it is this only that helps you to purify your little egoistic self, your selfishness and your grabbing tendency and self-centered living. It is this dynamic doing of good, dynamic selfless giving of yourself to others, dedicating your life and actions to other people's welfare and actions. It is this that cleanses you of your little selfishness, little I purifies you of your selfish nature, then you begin to proceed. It is in such an unselfish heart that real devotion comes and real noble thoughts arise. Otherwise the thoughts will be petty, ground level, if you are selfish. Therefore, the question, is it not selfishness to work for your own highest good? It is answered by saying, your part of your attaining highest good is by becoming totally unselfish and dedicating your life to working for the good of all. Therefore, the working for your highest good in terms of Vedanta and Yoga include a life of uh, constant goodness to others. We mentioned yesterday's satsang about this poem about others. Uh, I think Miriam got it from the house and gave the book to Carl like this. Uh, uh, message to my friend, uh, this little poem, others. The, uh, uh, one of the essential conditions of noble living is thinking of others, living for others, and, uh, working for others to happiness, together with your own life, uh, working for others to happiness. It is a greater part of your life. So, it is not selfishness, it is based upon unselfishness. It is based upon it is Paying your debt to God. It's a duty you owe to yourself that you are making. It made you, I think, appeal, made you in his image. 
it is a duty of all things to put, bring forth that image, realize that image. Hari huh? yo.
सेकंड पत्र दिया एच सी स्वामी चिदानंद जी महाराज सी स्वामी चिदानंद जी महाराज ऑक्यूपिंग होल लाइन बॉटम लाइन 24 9 1980 I give it if you are making any correspondence or writing to someone, you can put one in the library. Come. Yes. Ah, ah. This is for that. Then from. Ah. That's the other one. Charles, he wants to do this round to everyone. And first of all, take your question. Who is coming? Ah. Because you told me after it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Nadia. I, 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 I. This is for Mr. Rola. And this is for Mr. Rola. Uh, and this is for Nadia. And this is for you. <laughs> yes. Nadia is someone else. You want someone else. What I've been trying to tell you, huh? Uh, should I give it to uh, you? You give it. You give it. All in cover. Mother Inge, I'm giving you a shot. Now you can bring the flower in. In exchange for the flower, uh, take the shot from Mr. Funke's hand. Please, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, no.
I have to call tomorrow morning, not to cut them, and shall I take little chrysanthemums? You must take little flowers. Mm -hmm. You should not cut out. No, 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 they are enough. They, I have ordered enough that they wouldn't be cut any flowers. Okay. But if they are too small, so uh, too, too, too large, I look for smaller ones. This question must be directed to Swami Vimalananda and Swami Avala, <laughs> uh, Mother Christina. Uh, they, oh, it's their function, it's not my function. <laughs> I know nothing about the function. I'm present. It's not Swami's function. It's not my function. Yeah, yeah. So they are organizing the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> they know no. what they is required. And if you tell them, they will uh, tell you. I am not even informed, Swami. No. He <laughs> <laughs> wants to know what is the type of flowers you want to do your No, color. no, no, not that wasn't my question. I didn't want to make any mistakes, Swami. I was afraid to no, get no, no. the wrong flowers. No, no, flowers. flowers. Who asked you to bring flowers? It no. was me, whoever I have offered ah, to bring yeah. the flowers for, for, the for the function tomorrow morning. For the function, for the puja. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I, I'm saying the same thing. Yeah. I'm saying, what is the type of flower suitable for the puja? Individual flowers. Any no, flowers. she is already individual flowers. Yeah. 108? No, even more. Yes. So, but she wants to know. Whether yeah. smaller flowers. I have already yeah. explained to mother. Smaller, big, in everything, anything is fine. Any flowers. Big, no, small. Sorry. Yes. No, okay. Okay. Mother has asked mm. her to bring. Yes, from the village, yes. and therefore she is being. Yes. You better explain to her. Yo, bring, you bring small. You explain to her. Okay. Okay. Yes. She is a shopping yes. person. Yes. Huh? Okay. So I think uh, about about 110 or 20 of the small flowers. What do you call them? Mm -hmm. Small ones, you say. You said something. You said yes. small chrysanthemums. Chrysanthemums. Yes, chrysanthemums. Mm -hmm. are smaller ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. About, 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 about 120 are the smaller ones, and a few of the bigger ones. The <coughs> usually when you do puja, are you going to have any 108 yes, yes. When you do puja, you have uh, 108 times to put one who's doing it, 108. So I am telling you 110, 120 for the actual act of puja. And then at the end of puja, everyone is given a flower, finally, to put it there. So for that, it need not be 108. It, may, it has to be as many, at least, as the number of persons we expect. But it's more than, than 120, Swamiji. You mean for the formal function? Yes, we already are here. We are more than... Uh... No, no, no. We are purchasing two types of flowers. One is for the 108 offering. One is for each one to offer at the end of the uh, worship one flower. So 108 or 10 plus as many people. If you are 30 people, you want 30 more. If you are 40 people, you want 40 more. If you are 50, we can give it to everyone. <laughs> One for manual also. <laughs> <laughs> now you must really, I think, take thanks for Michi for his goodness, for all the good advice mm -hmm. he had. Definitely for Vedanta. Ah, you do definitely. Change of direction, apply your forces. Thank you, Yes, I'll go with you. We'll go with you. Yeah, we are, we are coming. Here is your letter. And so because you have come to Colon for this letter, how will you worship tomorrow? After tomorrow, I wish you all a very good night.